I'll jump right in. I'm very excited to be able to share with you today on evaluative thinking, which as as Brad kind of indicated, it's been something that I've been thinking about and researching now for many, many years. Um, and in more recent years, my colleagues and I have been framing it, especially in relation to this broader push for transformation that I'll share a little bit with you about. And that dovetails nicely with uh, the next session by Donna Mertens, of course, very leading thinker for many years on transformative mixed methods and transformative evaluation. And then more recently, I've been exploring how evaluative thinking embodies part of the importance of connection, the notion of connection in evaluation. So I'll, I'll share some basics of what evaluative thinking is, how it connects to connection and transformation, and then touch on some practical applications and some exciting new research directions, which some of you on this call are involved in, and hopefully pique your interest to have all of you um, get involved in looking at evaluative thinking in one way, shape, or form in your work. So I think it's, uh, you know, I started putting this slide in many years ago, and some people say post-COVID, other people say it's still going on. I think the COVID pandemic was a, a very stark moment in, in human history as to some of the assumptions we make about how our professional lives and personal lives work and, and what evaluation even can do in the world. Uh, similarly, the that state of war in the world, then whether it's in Ukraine or in Israel, is something that we cannot be immune to as evaluators. And then similarly, over the years, uh, especially in the U.S., but around the, the world, the recent years have seen an uptick in attention to um, amongst white people like myself, at least, of issues of racism, the need for anti-racism in evaluation, and the role of evaluation, if any, according to some, I would say there's a clear role in the struggle for social justice. Relatedly, and, and I always hesitate to start out with such a set of downer slides, but I think let's be let's be critical realists here. More and more, especially in Canada and, and in Europe, there are folks exploring how evaluation can do something to try to be relevant and pertinent in the face of the climate emergency mass extinction, et cetera. You may have seen this described as the poly crisis. I think it's an old term, but but really coming to the fore now. And that simply means when there are disparate crises that are interacting and interrelating such that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So a sort of system of problems. Democratic pluralism and governance is another potential casualty of the poly crisis. And this gets us even closer to evaluation as we wonder more and more about the role of facts and values and evidence and decision-making as society seeks to, to govern itself. So there's the poly crisis. There's an interlocking interrelatedness between the, the physical, environmental, and the sociological, social, economic side. If you're not familiar with this approach from Kate Raworth, the donut economics, I highly encourage you to look into it. I don't think we as evaluators are necessarily grappling with this work sufficiently, but it's an exciting way that we can try to think of, okay, what are we to do as evaluators? It's related also to the great divide, which is the, the basic inequality that has been a persistent and constant aspect of human society, but I think according to many studies is empirically at its, at its almost at its worst that it's ever been. So what is it, where does that leave us for evaluation? Um, I had the honor of participating in the uh, Canadian Evaluation Society conference this year in Quebec City. And there was a wonderful talk uh, by Linda Ray and Venetia Sauvin on s'adapter ou périr, quel futur pour l'évaluation dans un monde en constante mutation. So essentially saying, I mean, kind of dramatically, but I think it's worth worthwhile saying, what is the future of evaluation? And is, is evaluation even relevant given this polycrisis, given this constantly changing, constantly struggling world? Michael Quinn Patton has echoed these sentiments, actually sort of presaged them back a few years ago in relation to the coronavirus pandemic and asking specifically about criteria for transformation. So that brings us to this maxim, which I was inspired by through the blue marble evaluation approach, which I'll return to in just a few moments. 
that evaluating transformation requires transforming evaluation. So we often spend our days, you know, nibbling around the edges of evaluating whether a six week after school program led to changes in knowledge amongst middle school age youth. That is great. That is wonderful. And there's a place for that. And it's important for us to also question the criteria that we're using, the relevance of those criteria vis-a-vis the poly crisis, and the potential for transformative change that could help enact more justice and sustainable development across the globe. So the greatest danger for evaluators in times of turbulence is not the turbulence, but it's to act with yesterday's criteria, according to Patton. And this dovetails very nicely with the line of thinking and reasoning that Tom Schwant has been putting forward actually for probably at least 20 years, if not longer. Uh, But in this instance, most recently in 2019, when he began wondering about the need for or the reality that we may be moving into a a post-normal evaluation phase. And I'll, I'll touch on that a bit more towards the end of this presentation. But he sees us as needing to ask questions about evaluation's moral compass. And what kind of evaluation is relevant to understanding and assisting governance in today's sociopolitical, cultural, technological world? And he he proposes that we're kind of in this liminal in-between space. And I think that um, we are we are there. And there are many, many great minds in evaluation and great practitioners applying these changes all the time. But just to do a quick sort of, and this is not an exhaustive list, If we were to think, okay, what do we mean transformation in evaluation? Well, there's first Donna Mertens, and I didn't even know she was going to be your next speaker, so couldn't have planned it any better if I planned it. There's other approaches that are gaining currency in addition to the transformative paradigm. USAID has for a number of years now emphasized this collaborating, learning, and adapting approach, which whereas they're still very beholden to standard monitoring systems with quantitative indicators of of outputs, essentially. They're also interested in this more adaptive, flexible approach to doing evaluation together. Uh, Footprint evaluation and evaluation for planetary health, both innovations that have have come from uh, thought leaders in Canada, are very specific ways in which we're exploring transformation. Blue marble evaluation, CRE, decolonizing, and then truth and reconciliation in Canada, once again, not a conversation we're having in the United States as actively as we ought to be. But these are just a few specific ways in which the uh, the need for transformation is being manifested within the field of evaluation. As Brad mentioned, I've done a fair bit of work in various African contexts, especially Senegal, and I've been really inspired and motivated to see how my African evaluation colleagues are leading the way in thinking about transformation in, in terms of decolonization Uh, Hopefully, those of you who follow the Journal of Multidisciplinary Evaluation out of Western Michigan saw the recent two-volume special issue on on Indigenous and decolonizing evaluation. There's lots of great, great papers in there. That was guest edited by by Bageli Chilesa and and Nikki Bowman. I mentioned briefly culturally responsive and equitable evaluation. And this is going to tie into evaluative thinking quite directly in that if you look at some of these subpoints under the, the three overarching principles of equitable evaluation, you start to see that questioning assumptions, doing different types of critical thinking, taking multiple perspectives in terms of the effect of a strategy on different populations, et cetera, that there's a, there's a very close overlap between how I've been coming to understand evaluative thinking and what, in this case, Jaradine Coffey and her colleagues and many, many others I've been doing to implement equitable evaluation. Blue marble evaluation, I assume everybody is familiar with it, but but if you're not, you know, it's kind of a movement and approach led by Michael Quinn Patton and Charmaine Patton and many others. Predicate, you often hear Michael talk about this image, which is the iconic Earthrise image taken by William Anders out of the window of Apollo 8 in 1968. Um, and in this sense, as I'm going to talk a little bit about evaluative thinking as it relates to connection, part of the uh, the impact of this image on humanity was that it was one of the first times that we were seeing the entire globe as, as one image. Obviously, that did not help us be any more just and wise in our decisions as a society, but it, it did start maybe tipping some scales that way. So, So the blue marble evaluation brings this way of thinking into evaluation, and I think evaluative thinking does as well. 
principles of blue marble emphasize strongly transformation as well as others. And then specifically, Patton suggested in this blog post back right when the pandemic was starting, that one concrete way of addressing transformation through blue marble evaluation is to model systematic evaluative thinking. So that's a quick overview of transformation and why it connects to evaluative thinking. And then more recently, actually at the at the invitation of some colleagues in, in Texas and in the US, I started thinking about the role of connection in evaluation and a sort of tentative typology of how, well, where, where connection just shows up in evaluation. You could think for, for a moment, okay, where does connection show up in my practice, in my research? A few answers to that question that occurred to me are that we need to have connection between the different actors in the evaluation ecosystem, the evaluators, the program people, and the program participants. We also need to have connections between the different conceptual or logical elements of an evaluative claim, which in, in this case, you know, you could be, say specifically between the evidence and the conclusions. That in a sense is a, a framing of, of what, what Scriven, may he rest in peace, would and, and many others have described as the uh, the logic of evaluation or an evaluation specific methodology. And so here I'm referring to that in terms of alignment. And I'll come back to that and, and say, what do I mean by alignment? But it's that logical through flow of uh, from you know the questions you ask all the way through to the claims you make. And then perhaps lastly, you know, the past 30 years really have seen this proliferation of approaches to doing evaluation. And they all um, have some maybe core elements, but there's also many different variations. There was a great session at the American Evaluation Association with Katrina Bledsoe and Sebastian Lemire and John Lavelle and others on the sort of different graphical visual maps folks have been using to represent the whole panoply of approaches and purposes for doing evaluation. But there needs to be some connection uh, between that. So a paper just came out recently, I believe it was in, um, eval in the journal Evaluation or maybe Evaluation Review on the relationship between accountability and learning, I think in German development assistance evaluation. So that's an age old question. How does learning relate to accountability and vice versa? So those are all questions of connection. Right. Um, you know, when you think of the the extreme popularity of collaborative, participatory, and empowerment types of evaluation, of which Brad, of course, is one of the 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 founding fathers of those approaches and has also done a lot of great thinking about how they interact and relate, connection is fundamental to all of those approaches, unlike maybe some older approaches that that feign some sort of objectivity between the evaluator and the evaluand which was never real, it was just a, a farce. And so I, I propose to you today that evaluative thinking is key to understanding these connections. This cartoon from Michael Quinn Patton, I think very much represents that paradigm shift that the whole collaborative, participatory, et cetera, revolution in, within evaluation sort of represents, that there is not a absolute border line between program territory and evaluation land. That 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 artificial border has has eroded over the years and um, with things like developmental evaluation, even simply the the concept of process use, people are not just looking for the, the, the findings, the reports that's going to sit on a dusty shelf. Evaluation for connection and transformation is different. It's embedded, it's active, it's adaptive. That is at its ideal. And I will propose to you that evaluative thinking is a useful lens for thinking about, talking about, and doing and researching that type of evaluation. And so here from this, this is now many, I forget what year this was, but many years ago, Clear, Vitz, Rockefeller, and Interaction did this nice case study report on four international development organizations where evaluative thinking was, was very present, kind of, it was tacit, it was right below the surface, but they did some empirical work to understand sort of where evaluative thinking shows up. And Michael Patton had this nice quote from the preface to this report. And I think it's really fundamental for what we're talking about today. You know, evaluation is an activity, but evaluative thinking is a way of doing business. So, okay, 
enough of that. What is evaluative thinking? Well, so back in probably 2009, my colleague, Jane Buckley, who Brad mentioned, uh, she and I were doing some evaluation capacity building work. And we realized that some people just naturally got it. You know, we're working with non-evaluators. They, in this case, they were STEM educators, science, technology, engineering, and math educators. And some of them just got it right away. And some of them were very resistant. And so we, we, we were wondering, what is it? And, and Jane said, well, it's because some of them are natural evaluative thinkers. So, of course, as a graduate student at the time, I decided to do a literature search because that's what one does. Um, and found that all these wonderful people, really inspirational people, were talking about it, but there was no clear, concise definition. Um, now, separately, uh, Tom Schwant and others have raised the question of, you know, to what extent do we need definitional purity and, and absoluteness in our terms, right? We, we need to have enough of a common understanding of a term that we can we can talk about it together. But I, I agree with him that we, we don't need a once and for all definition. I mean, you think about evaluation capacity building, which is one of my favorite topics. There's at least 10 really great definitions out there. Some in increasing length, some of them are like whole paragraphs. And I, I think that's that's fine. So the same is true for evaluative thinking. But we wanted to just get down on paper what we understood it to be based on our practice in ECB and based on our reading of the literature and evaluation and in some adjacent fields. And so we elucidated a definition in 2015 and have since updated it because it had lots and lots of flaws. And so this is now, it's hopefully going to come come out in a chapter in, in a, a few months time. We've just made a few tweaks, but we believe that uh, as imperfect as this may be, this is a relatively functional working definition. Evaluative thinking is a cognitive and relational process motivated by an attitude of inquisitiveness and a belief in the value of evidence that involves identifying assumptions, posing thoughtful questions, marshalling evidence to make judgments, pursuing deeper understanding, and making logically aligned, contextualized decisions in preparation for action. Very much a, a mouthful. But this is this is what we're working with so far. And there's others out there who are doing wonderful work uh, to sort of try to understand what evaluative thinking even is from their own perspectives as well. Note, mind you, that it's a relational process. So therefore, the notion of connection comes right to the fore. At some point over the years, it hit me quite starkly that evaluative thinking can and should perhaps be framed at least on two different levels, even though it is the same thing, just two different vantage points, perhaps. The first, well, in no particular order, it is a fundamental philosophical concept at the heart of evaluation. So this is that evaluation-specific methodology, the logic of evaluation, evaluative reasoning, as Tom Schwant once said, we should have called it. And it's also a way to do ECD, which is how Jane and I first came to it. You know, I am passionate about working alongside non-evaluators to help them tap into their natural proclivity to do evaluative thinking and to unleash the power of inquiry in their work. That's what I really love doing. I don't get to do it that much anymore in my, in my day job, but still walking around, always looking for opportunities to do that. So these two levels relate to each other, but they are somewhat different. We were able to do a 2018 New Directions for Evaluation volume on evaluative thinking. So that's now, of course, many years ago. But that really helped us push the thinking forward on even what this thing is. So Anne Vo and colleagues did a very robust, rigorous, conceptual, thematic analysis looking across, I think, thousands of, of articles and systematically elucidating the core conceptual concepts at the heart of evaluative thinking, and then elucidated this, this sort of model you see here on the right, that evaluative thinking touches... Uh, embeds cognition and application between values and valuing. Similarly, Leslie Fierro and colleagues, working off of some, some empirical work they did with the Centers for Disease Control in the US, uh, looked for indicators of ET and uh, the relationship between them, which you see here. So this is all really good, and there's some exciting ongoing research I'll touch on right at the end of the presentation, but just to sort of lay out what it is. But as we grappled with what it is i think like any great difficult concept the more you the more you push on it the more you dig in the more you uncover 
further layers and dimensions of of sort of complexity and uncertainty and possibly even some paradoxes. So some, and this is again, a non-exhaustive list, but some paradoxes that we've encountered while grappling with what evaluative thinking even is, is one that as a concept is both very, very old and very new. So Scriven, he, as far as I know, he, he didn't really, ever, he certainly never wrote about evaluative thinking, but in a large sense, when he said the word evaluation, he, because of his very broad, I, I call it the Scrivenesque framing of evaluation, where as you know, if you ever read his work or listened to him speak about evaluation, that he re- he included, you know, consumer reports and going into the grocery store and walking down the road. And, you know, it's not just about formal professional program evaluation. It's also all the other types of evaluation, policy, personnel, product evaluation. And it's also, even though he under stood of course that it was a professional endeavor as a as a transdiscipline and as a fundamental part of reasoning and cognition that it was everywhere and in that sense it evolved he said on numerous occasions long before science so if you have your science your, your you know your researcher colleagues who who look down their nose at you as an evaluator because oh that's so applied and so isn't that cute you're evaluating that program you can come back with to them and say, well, actually, you know, science, sciences are relative Johnny come lately compared to evaluation, because our ancestors were doing evaluation millions of years before science was ever invented. But at the same time, as a concept, it wasn't really addressed in our field until really until um, I would say Hallie Preskill was the president of AEA. We started to see an uptick in the use of that term and in people focusing on it more specifically. Similarly, another paradox is that it's very natural, but it's also difficult. Normally, in in longer workshops on this, I would grace you with a picture of one of my young daughters. So sadly, that is not in this presentation. I'm I'm really cutting you short here. But to make this point that, you know, it is absolutely an innate human skill that everybody develops and possesses. And there I show you a picture of a very, very cute, you know, four-year-old. Because if you've ever spent any time with with young children, you know how expert they are at asking questions. And when you answer the question, they come up with another question. We as researchers, as graduate students, we ought to find ways to rekindle that childlike joy of questioning. Sometimes we lose that. And so we need we need to tap into that. And everybody can can do it. And at the same time, like lots of other activities in life, you get better at it when you are more intentional about it. And you get better at it when you practice it. So I think that's, that's not necessarily a paradox. It's just a a truism about something like evaluative thinking. In this sense, and I'm also really beholden to um, Feng Pham, who's I believe on this call, that the importance of Ernie House's work on evaluative thinking and the way in which he brought in Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. So you're probably familiar with that very, you know, best-selling book uh, by Kahneman. But if you're not, a lot of it was predicated on this existence of two types or systems of thinking. System one, which is quick and automatic, and system two, which is more focused and, and deliberative. And Ernie House said as long ago as 2015, but I think there's traces of it in his earlier writings as well, that both system one and system two are fundamentally evaluative, you know, very much in that Scrivenesque sense. And so he determined in making that claim that all human thought is is fundamentally evaluative. That's a bold statement. It might be a bit a bit much, but it certainly suggests that according to the the great Ernie House, evaluative thinking is is quite fundamental to human thought. This also is something that um, Fung helped me think about many years ago, the the role of intuition in evaluative thinking. Uh, Because sometimes, especially if we're thinking about evaluative reasoning, there's a risk that it moves very much just into the head, a purely cognitive function. Also, there's a risk that it can become purely individualistic because sort of Euro-American 
epistemologies tend to, with that sort of Cartesian divide, tend to really think about thinking as an individual psychological practice. But there's obviously millions of pages written about social learning, about social psychology, that suggests that thinking and doing is, is fundamentally a social process. And I agree with that. Also, Marta Herto and others have, have echoed what Fung has said in terms of the role of uh, intuition in evaluative thinking. And uh, long story short, at the very least, seasoned evaluators are constantly drawing on a reservoir of past experiences to probably through system one thinking, make rapid, almost tacit, not necessarily decisions, but assumptions and have thought processes related to their experience, which then they use to inform the crafting of key evaluation questions or of metrics or data collection tools. So you, you can't just write an evaluation report based on intuition. I don't think that would be evaluation. But Marta and others have suggested that intuition really has a strong role. Her studies did find that uh, younger evaluators were more hesitant to almost admit or to, to be okay with the fact that intuition has a role in evaluation, because in some senses, we're taught that that is not objective or that is not empirical. So evaluative thinking is one way to help us understand the role of intuition, I think, as long as we don't fall too much into the trap of framing evaluative thinking as a, as an individualistic, cognitive, rational, solely rational exercise. And then this very much is um, getting back to that earlier point on Scriven and seeing evaluation everywhere. You know, when you go, I, I, I just had two muffins for lunch. I decided which muffins I wanted to, to buy from the, from the bake shop next door. Uh, what criteria was I using for those muffins? You know, was I doing evaluation? Not formally, but I, but I was evaluating the muffin options. In organizations, this also bears true where, and this is, you know, folks from ECB, folks from internal evaluation, we love when everyone throughout all of an organization is doing evaluative thinking so that it's not just the evaluator down the hall. It's the, you know, the procurement officer, it's the HR manager, it's every single function in an organization ought to be animated by evaluative thinking, I say. To that end, also, very sadly, there are times when formal evaluation seems to be occurring without any evaluative thinking. So that's what, like, Boris Volkov has, has talked about sort of evaluation on autopilot. Peter Dollar Larson has, has lamented this in many of his writings, the sort of in Europe, there's with a sort of the vestige of new public management and very, very robust evaluation functions within public governance. Sometimes it can become rote and sort of automatic and automated. Automation with AI and machine learning, that's a whole separate issue. We won't go there. That'll be a talk for another day. But luckily, there's lots and lots of people thinking about that. Because can AI do evaluative thinking? Suffice it to say that very sadly, you know, someone can sit down and write a survey create a survey, and it could be technically sound, but if they're not applying evaluative thinking, it might be technically sound at gathering data on the wrong thing in that context or for that program. And that's when good you know, evaluation's happening, but without enough evaluative thinking. And so I, I posit that the best evaluation happens when good evaluation know-how and technique is wedded with good evaluative thinking. And then this one is a big one that I know Stuart and Rebecca Pavli, who is on the call as well, has been grappling with. What is the nature of the relationship between critical thinking and evaluative thinking? Our older definition of evaluative thinking had critical thinking as like the second and third word. We basically said evaluative thinking is critical thinking applied to context of evaluation, which, which was wrong to say. Sorry, sorry, Rebecca, but it was wrong. And I'm glad that you're helping us see the, the error of our ways. But it's still fascinating to, to understand and unpack the, the difference. I'm referring to Rebecca and Stuart because they had a session at AEA this year on this very topic, both on how to measure evaluative thinking and how to grapple with this fuzzy relationship between critical thinking and evaluative thinking. And so Schwant at one point wrote in his 2015 book, that evaluative thinking requires critical thinking. 
And Scriven, who actually is more known globally for his work on critical thinking, even probably than, than evaluation, he said in describing critical thinking back in 1984, that it requires evaluative thinking along with a whole slew of other types of thinking. Is it? Are we even calling it the right thing? Thomas Delahaye has translated it. I saw in, in our brochure for today's session, it was translated as la pensée evaluative, which is how I've discussed it in French, but Thomas has suggested that it should have been called la posture evaluative. It's more of a stance than a than a just pensée. Pensée is almost too flat, too, too simple. So nevertheless, there we are. This I've already touched on. I think I'll Hopefully you've encountered this in your courses if you're a student, so we can jump jump through that. What really matters to me and what brings me back to both connection and transformation is the role of evaluative thinking in helping us avoid the pitfalls of technical rationality and helping us tap into practical wisdom for evaluation. And if you're not familiar with technical rationality, it's an epistemology of practice that was discussed by many people. In my, in my reading, most acutely by Argerus and Schoen, especially Donald Schoen, he called it the dominant epistemology of professional practice that assumed that all of, all of professional practice entailed essentially applying technical fixes to technical problems, that that is the role of the practitioner. In the U.S., especially, we saw that in stark relief in the around 2002, 2003. And the book that Stuart did with Mel Mark and, and Tina Christie on basically the great gold standard debates really, really touched on this is sort of what is evidence, what is credible evidence, and how is it understood to inform practice? So Schwant, again, you know, asks us sort of as a harbinger to the move towards post-normal evaluation. We can teach, we can train, we can do workshops. We have IPDET, we have wonderful training programs and evaluation. We have TEI, we have, we have this that we're doing right now, right? And so as we learn evaluation together, are we able to learn the technique and the sort of tools and tips? And are we also able to grapple with the disposition and the capacity to engage in moral, ethical, and political reflection on what it is that we're here doing together? Um, so here's a little bit more on instrumentality and and, and um, technical rationality. And what Schwant and many, many others are, are calling for and saying is actually here is much more of a reflection and action, ongoing experimentation, wisdom of practice. So Marta Herto and I uh, had the opportunity to co-edit this volume in a series that Stuart is uh, the lead editor of, along with Katrina Bledsoe. Um, and so wonderful set of chapters here. If you haven't got your hands on this yet, I encourage you to do so. It's not all about evaluative thinking. It's about practical wisdom, but evaluative thinking is sprinkled all throughout. And in particular, Tiffany Tovey and I tried to grapple with the, in this case, the nature of the relationship between evaluative thinking, reflective practice, and practical wisdom. So um, you'll have these slides after you can sort of unpack this, this diagram a little bit more. It's it's complicated. I'm not sure we got it completely right, but we hopefully provided some food for thought about the nature of this relationship. To wrap that up and to move towards sort of a hopefully some some points that can foster some good discussion amongst the group. I like to think about evaluative thinking as as a praxis, you know, that perfect coming together of theory and practice. And as a praxis, I hope that it can help us as, as evaluators and researchers and program implementers, number one, demystify theory, right? So, so many times, including in evaluation conferences, I hear people say, theory is useless to me. I do not use theory. And I understand them because theory, if and when they encountered it, was like, Foucault, bless his heart, you know, like the, the longest sentences, the most obfuscated, you know, let, let alone Deleuze and Watari, who I do not understand at all. Um, and then we're not that bad with evaluation theory, but even people who've gone through evaluation graduate programs, they, they struggle with sort of articulating what is an evaluation theory, even though, as you know, Shadish famously said, it is, it makes us who we are, right? We need to demystify theory by framing it simply as a tool to think with. Theory is a tool to think with. 
And then on the flip side, we need to remystify practice as a way of resisting the tide of technical rationality that would suggest that, you know, an educator under No Child Left Behind or any of the educational policies that followed it, that their job is simply to open up a box, take out the curriculum and implement it. That in my dissertation study, where I was looking at evidence-based programs, I encountered actual cases where that's how the system had been constructed. Whereas five years prior, the educator could um, do whatever they want, which mind you has its problems because they were introducing fallacies into the, you know, it was a sexual health program and they were, you know, basing things off their own belief system to do the education, which could be problematic. But then the funding structure changed after 2002, 2003, such that the job of the educator was to open up a cardboard box, take out the CD, put it in the CD player and take a piece of paper and read it. And that became education. So that's not what practice is. That's not the mis- the mysticism of practice. So in practice, what does this mean? Well, I've touched a bit on ECB and I just want to say, you know, all these great ideas, which I think are wonderful to talk about. Over the years, we've had a chance to put them into practice through a series of workshops. So this is very much on the ECB side of, of um, evaluative thinking. And I think it has had wonderful effects in the organizations we've worked with. Catholic Relief Services has had invested quite a bit in it, as well as a few foundations. I got to give a shout out to our colleague, Guy Chirac, uh, who's now retired from CRS, but he was their global lead for, for learning. And he was a strong supporter and contributor to all of our work on this. Created a lot of um, facilitation materials to help people do this in their organizations. And we started seeing anecdotal evidence that it was having making a difference. The, the last few things in terms of how it applies in practice, I mentioned earlier on in terms of how this relates to transformation, that one of the main ways is that it helps us identify and um, seek to understand better the assumptions that we're operating under. One of the clearest ways to do this is through participatory theory of change model development to help articulate that, that miracle that occurs in the middle of our programs. So that's something we've done. I mean, this is a standard approach to a lot of ECB, but it's still something that people are just encountering for the first time these days. And it's worth emphasizing that when you have program implementers and program participants sit down and map out their own theory of change, and then you structure them through that, wonderful things can happen. It's some of the most sort of earth shattering experiences in my in my professional career have been by doing workshops like this. Uh, then last, I, I mentioned already the debates around credible evidence. There's a whole bundle of assumptions that we have to unpack if we are to um, apply evaluative thinking to even our own notions of what counts as, as evidence. We don't have time to get into the whole RCT debates, but you don't need an RCT to know if parachutes work. If you haven't read that book by Stuart, Tina, and, and Mel, this is the old edition. There's a newer edition of this. You should get the new edition. I mentioned alignment at the beginning. Evaluative thinking helps you align the questions, the evidence, and the claim. And that is the true gold standard. And in in practice, what does this mean for practitioners? One time, Jane and I were working with, again, it was those same STEM educators who were at the outset of our work on this. And one of them thought that the funder, which was the National Science Foundation, wanted them to essentially do either an RCT or a longitudinal study to be able to make the claim that their after-school program caused more, you know, young people from historically marginalized populations to pursue careers in science. Well, we said, no, you don't have to do that. As long as your questions and evidence and claims are aligned, you can have an evidence-based program derived through other ways. Here's just a few examples of that. This, I've already mentioned, Dollar Larson, uh, technical rationality, post-normal evaluation, which fundamentally asks, are modernity's blueprints for evaluation, have they run their course? Are we operating in a paradigm that is no longer relevant, where we're in a world, whether it's the poly crisis or the whole panoply of potential beautiful connections and relationships and new systems that can emerge, hopefully, there's unpredictability, there's slipperiness, there's plurality. Where are log frames going to get us faced with that? Robin Wall Kimmerer, and this was really pertinent, especially at CES, because we also had 
another keynote on the right of rivers, the personhood of rivers, where does the natural world come in through blue marble, through footprint, through these new approaches to evaluation that emphasize the relationality amongst all aspects of the world? So to conclude, we need transformation. Evaluative thinking from a pluralistic lens is the way to do so. It democratizes, decentralizes the inquiry. It taps into practical wisdom. It is a way of applying systems thinking, and it balances intuition and rationality. So hopefully I've shown that these connections and more are really central to evaluation, and evaluative thinking helps us manifest them in a way that is germane to the transformations that are needed. And now, because Brad asked me to think about, okay, what are some next steps? And really, here's where I could turn it over to Rebecca, so or or Fung, or both. But we still don't have a good enough grasp on measuring it, on distinguishing it from critical thinking, on assess. You know, I've been selling this thing now for like ten years, and I'm pretty sure it's not snake oil. I'm pretty sure it works, but we got to know. I got I got to have some more evidence for my claims, and that we don't really quite have that yet. And then, you know, Emily Gates and others uh, doing all this great work on values and valuing research on what evaluators actually do. How are they tapping into their evaluative thinking? And all of that is what we need to get to the transformations that we have to get to. So with that, I thank you. 